and welcome back to Elizabeth City Baptist Church on a Sunday night service. Go ahead and stand and join us as we sing 180, Standing on the Promises. 180 in your blue hymnals. We are standing on the promises of Christ our King. 180, 180, Standing on the Promises. First, second, fourth verse. Here we go. And standing on the promises of Christ my King. Through eternal ages His praise has Sylvia, Lord, we all love her so much, Lord. She was 
uh, such a blessing to our church while she was here, and now she's living up in Virginia. I pray, Lord, that you would guide her to the right church, Lord, and maybe the Chesapeake Baptist Church would become her new church home. Lord, we lift up Miss Patty, Lord, and specifically her mom, Miss Janice, that you would give her the spiritual and the physical and emotional strength that she needs. Lord, I pray that you would give Miss Patty the, uh, the, the grace and the wisdom, Lord, to make the right decisions, to be there for her mother. Lord, help us as a church to continually pray for her and her mom and to be there for her in any way that we can. Lord, we love you and we need you in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Number three in your blue hymnals, Come Thou Fount. Page number zero three in the hymnal, Come Thou Fount. Every blessing to my heart to sing thy praise. Number three, everybody, we have one more awesome opportunity to sing out to the Lord our God. Number three, Come Thou Fount. Here we go. Come Thou Fount of every blessing. yesterday for a follow-up visit and uh boy if you're in here and you have a follow-up visit pastor i talked to this guy and he wanted to get saved this gal uh just text the pastor let my wife know and we'll get over there to visit them and anyways ronald was not there but we talked to this lady she said it, her his friend um and her name was yvonne tillett and uh, she had first said that she wasn't sure she was saved, so I was going through the gospel with her. And then she, we got to the end, and she seemed kind of confused. And she said, oh, I, I've already been saved. And she says, in fact, uh, this, this church here, I, I've been to this church. I said, you've been to our church? Well, come to find out, she came to our church for our Thanksgiving Sunday. She got a turkey. She came for the turkey Sunday. And then one of us men, we had so many visitors to follow up on, we couldn't visit them all. And we, one of us men, uh, must have called her, witnessed to her over the phone, and she prayed and asked the Lord to save her over the phone. And it's just a blessing, you know, how the Lord has, uh, although she has not come since the Thanksgiving Sunday, the Lord brought us directly to her house. And we never had a chance to talk to Mr. Ronald, went back later that day, so twice on Saturday. And uh, still, still, still hunting him down, still hunting him down. Um, but the Lord has just done great things for us. Um, I think I shared this in Sunday school, but not in the 11 o'clock. Uh, you know, with the recent shootings we've had in the in the church neighborhood and around here, we decided to go to some of the neighborhoods and uh, clean the streets. And the way to clean the streets is to get some of these teenagers saved. Right. And uh, I mentioned it to the men at breakfast yesterday. I read an article recently, and up in Hampton Roads, they had a meeting of all the police chiefs from Virginia Beach and Chesapeake and Portsmouth and Hampton and Newport News. I believe the five, six cities represented there. Um, and one thing that they noted was it used to be the average A's of the gangbangers were 17, or gangsters, I should say, 
uh, were 17 to 24, but now the ages are like 13 to 17. And so we're not even talking about high school kids, we're talking about elementary kids. And uh, you know, that are, that are just living out what their music is teaching them to do and the lack of a good, strong father figure at home. And our politicians try to figure out how to fix it all the time, but it's just a return to biblical principles. And rather than complaining about it and rather than you know moaning and groaning about it, let's go lead some of them to Christ, amen? But boy, they get saved, they get in a good church, get around some good men of God that will lead them in the right direction, and the Lord can turn this city upside down. Uh, and I think the Bible said about the apostles, they had turned the world upside down. Lord, the world would be nice, but let's just have Elizabeth City. Amen, Brother Pete. Let's just start right here. Then we'll reach out to this region, the county. Then we'll get the state, and then we'll work on the world. Amen. Well, we'll start right here. Anyways, the ladies' soul winning is this, uh, this uh, Tuesday at 10 o'clock, and all of you ladies are invited to that. The ladies have a ladies' night. It's a dinner uh, ending with a devotional, and it's not this Friday, but next Friday at... Six o'clock? Okay, great. Great. So it's at six o'clock, and um, I know it will be a treat. You will not want to miss that. And then our teen activity is this Friday, meeting here, leaving here at the church at 6 p.m. And praise the Lord. That being said, we'll move on to our offering time. And uh, Brother James, if you could come take our offerings, you want us here tonight at the right. And uh, praise the Lord. Our giving verse for this month is 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 7. The Bible says, every man according, we should try to say this together. We've been saying it all month. Can we do this? Can we do this? Ready? Every man according as he purposeth in his heart, so let him give, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loveth a cheerful giver. Brother Philip, you got the song leading down. We need the scripture memorization, my brother. You're using the cheat sheet. And uh, Brother James, I appreciate all you do here. If you could ask the Lord to bless the title. Lord, we're thankful to be in your house tonight and to honor you through your word. Lord, we thank you so much for the sacrifice you made for us till we make our salvation. We thank you for our many blessings. Bless this offering we're about to receive. If you are glad to give some back. Amen. Amen.
playing, Miss Amber playing in the morning, and my wife playing. It's a lot of work and practice that goes into playing the piano. Amen. And it's a lot easier to sing to the piano than to play the piano. And praise the Lord. Go ahead and take your Bibles to Acts chapter number 12. It's good to see Ryan back with us. Was out of town this last uh, week down in Florida. Good to see Ryan and Brother Pete. Brother Pete, it's going to be his last service here for a little bit, going back to Arizona. But we will definitely miss him. That's not a praise the Lord, Brother Pete. That's that's a, that's a sadness. Praise the Lord. Brother Pete's gone. And uh, he's such a blessing to me personally and to our church, just stopping by the church and coming out here and getting right to the work of the Lord. Amen. Right. 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 Um, Acts chapter number 12. <clears throat> As I mentioned this morning, the title of the message um, re really catches your eye, but the title is What Happened After Easter? What Happened After Easter? And the word Easter is in the Bible. Um, the, and so we'll be looking at that. We won't really be studying that, but rather what happened after Easter. And, okay, good. Good. Acts chapter 12. Look down at verse number 1, please. And I'm going to read from verse 1 down through verse 5. The Bible says, Now about that time Herod the king stretched forth his hands to vex certain of the church. And he killed James, the brother of John, with the sword. And because he saw it please the Jews, he proceeded further to take Peter also. Then were the days of unleavened bread. Verse 4. And when he had apprehended him, he put him in prison and delivered him to four quaternions of soldiers to keep him, intending after Easter to bring him forth to the people. Peter, therefore, was kept in prison, but prayer was made without ceasing of the church unto God for him. What happened after Easter? Specifically here, when I said that this morning, you might have thought, well, what happened after the resurrection of Jesus Christ? And that was not my intention, but after here in verse 4, intending after Easter, Peter, of course, being put in prison, and after Easter would be brought unto the people. If you noticed in verse number 3 in your Bibles, it had a phrase in parentheses. You probably noticed that. Then were the days of unleavened bread. That would have been the time of the Passover. And you can correlate that to another scripture earlier in the New Testament. Again, the um, if you did not know that the tradition, the feast, the festival of Easter goes back has a pay, actually has a pagan history. You didn't know that, okay? The history is not a Christian history, um, which is why at our church we call the the Easter Sunday Resurrection Sunday. And I don't. I don't think it's the end of the world if somebody calls it Easter Sunday, uh, but it'd be the same thing as Christmas. I mean, Jesus Christ, if you didn't know, was not born on December the 25th. Uh, but what it was is years ago, the Roman Empire sought to take a uh, pagan tradition, the winter solstice, incorporated Christian tradition, celebrating, celebrating the birth of Christ, tried to make it into one to unify the Roman Empire. So nothing wrong with taking one day out of the year and celebrating the birth of Christ, but you could celebrate the birth of Christ any day. Amen? Uh, nothing necessarily wrong with taking one day out of the year and specifically celebrating the resurrection of Christ. But biblically, you could have a resurrection Sunday every single week. You could have a Christmas Sunday every single week. And if you study throughout the Bible, um, God does not command us to set aside these specific holy days. You know, bless God, you've got to have a Christmas Sunday. You've got to have a resurrection Sunday and a Thanksgiving Sunday. Um, in fact, it's quite the opposite. So it's one of those things, it's not a sin to have that, um, as long as it's not taken away from the Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, with Easter Sundays, I mean, even, even lost people will celebrate Easter. And maybe they don't celebrate it by coming to church, but the Easter bunny and the, uh, the face painting and painting the eggs. And I, I remember, I think, painting eggs growing up and finding candy eggs, things like that. But back to Acts chapter 12. What happened after Easter? This is a really neat story in your Bibles. If you've not read it before, you're in for a treat. We see in the start of the chapter that persecution is coming upon the believers. And can you imagine living through that time of persecution? In truth, it's nothing that we can totally understand. And maybe you are following a, a news or a newspaper that records the Christian persecution over in Libya Places like Pakistan, Afghanistan, Iraq, um, Saudi Arabia, where people are literally being killed for what they believe, being killed for preaching about the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, we come to church, and when we prepare to come to church tonight, 
Not a care in the world. Not that we didn't have any burdens, but none of us came to church tonight looking around the corners. Nobody came to church tonight and, uh, Pastor, are the doors locked? Nobody came to church tonight and said, Pastor, this isn't being recorded. I don't want to be on camera. And when we were uh, at my dad's church and we were doing service, some people said that. They said, Pastor, if you're going to record the service, I don't want to be on camera because I don't want the authorities to have any record that I was attending an indoor church service. And some people took it that far. But none of us came to church with that fear of persecution. And why is that? It's not because the Lord gave us that. Because if you read in the New Testament, the New Testament church, the apostles, they did not have freedom of religion. That came because we are blessed to live in a country called the United States of America where we have the freedom of religion. And so I am thankful for America. I'm thankful for all the sacrifices that brave men and women have done throughout the years to keep our freedom for us. And God did not promise us religious freedom. He said you need to get out there and give the gospel, preach the gospel to the ends of the earth, whether you have religious freedom or whether you do not have religious freedom. So if we were to suddenly lose that religious freedom, it doesn't mean we should close the shop and say, well, I guess we can't go soul winning anymore. I guess we can't have church anymore. No, Christians since the time of Jesus Christ have always served God in fear of that religious persecution. That's where we find ourselves in Acts chapter 12. And we had a small taste, a small taste of religious persecution in 2020 and 2021. And I don't know if you remember, maybe you were going to church when the, uh, the pandemic first started. I mean, I was. And when our, in Upper Virginia, when the governor passed an executive order limiting the number of people in a gathering to 10 people, to 10 people, who does he think he is to tell us we can't have more than 10 people meeting at the same time? And um, anyways, they also didn't win the re-election either. Praise God. Hallelujah. Send him back. Right. But anyways, I remember the law being, the, the, not the law, but the executive order being passed, and we continued to have service. And it was a Wednesday night in the service, and it was on April Fool's Day. And uh, after the service, we had the doors locked. Okay, so we locked the doors so nobody could just sneak in on us or anything. And somebody said, Pastor, not me, but to my, to my father, Pastor, the police are right behind you. And he said, oh, it's April Fool's. And that's not even funny. He said, no, 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 the police are right behind you. And they were. And they threatened to arrest my dad if we had another indoor church service. Uh, Pastor Jack Treber of the North Valley Baptist Church. Um, uh, they're in Southern California. They're in Southern Santa Clara, California. Anyone ever been to Santa Clara, California? No? Okay, Brother, Brother Red. I've not been there, but my dad's been there multiple times. They stayed open. Now, this is a church of a few thousand people, okay? This is a pastor that's been there for many, many years, a great man of God. And they were getting fined for every indoor church service that they held. So imagine you come to church on a Sunday morning and the sheriff or one of the deputies or whoever the magistrate comes and places a notice and finds them $1,000. They say, well, bless God, but God wants us to have church. They have church Sunday night. The magistrate or the, our deputy comes up, places another fine for $1,500. And every time that they disobeyed the, the uh, governor's order, the fine would increase. And they stayed open, eventually got to the point where they were about to be fined out of business. I'm talking about thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars. They had a Bible college, and they kept their Bible college open, and they started getting fined on Monday. And they would get fined on Tuesday. I mean, they were out to get them. And eventually, they were forced to do outdoor services. And, uh, boy, you want to talk about the pressure. And this is not a young preacher boy that was out looking for trouble. This is a gentleman that's been there for years and years and years. But they faced that religious persecution here in America. Pastor David Owen Sr., who passed away last year, who's in heaven, he pastored the Pacifica Baptist Church, again, in California. And uh, they were told that if they had another indoor church service, that the pastor would be arrested and the church would be fined. And so what they did is they parked about a two, block or two away from the church. They all turned and park away from the church and then walked one by one into the church, keep the doors locked, keep the lights off, and so they could, the cops would come through the parking lot looking every single weekend. They would look for whether or not those Christians are having church in the middle of a pandemic. That's religious persecution. But here the Bible tells us in verse number 2, Acts 12, 2, Herod the king, and he killed James, the brother of John, with the sword. Now, that's religious persecution being stepped up a notch. Pastor, where, where's Brother Pete at? Well, sit down. You see, we were having church service, and uh, all of a sudden the soldiers came in, and we all fled. But 
Brother Pete, he was righteous or bold as a lion. He preached the gospel and they skewered him with the sword. He died right there in the middle of the auditorium. His wife still hasn't got over the shock of it. Now that's religious persecution. How do you go on after something like that? Could you imagine? But here, that's exactly what happened. And we think we have it tough because we wake up and we're a little tired and it's a little hard to come to church. They killed one of the leaders of the early church here, yet they still continue to have church and to serve God. Nobody here in America, at least since the, uh, at least since the uh, amendments in the Constitution have been ratified, nobody here in America has been killed for preaching the gospel. Now, prior to the Declaration of Independence, prior to the, uh, the Constitution being ratified in 1791, there, were, there was Christian religious persecution here in America. If you didn't know that. Uh, most of it was carried out by the Church of England. The Church of England, now their name has been changed to the Anglican Church. There's an Anglican church over in Camden. I seriously doubt whether they know their history. They had a part in beating and killing and hanging and whipping and imprisoning Baptists, mainly Baptists, and also Methodist preachers for simply preaching the gospel. So it has happened here before. Moving on with the story, back to, back to now the set the scene, back to the story in Acts chapter 12. <clears throat> this is Herod the king. This is not the same Herod the king that killed uh, all the babies. Remember when Jesus was uh, just a young child and Herod the king sent the soldiers out to kill all? This is not the same Herod. Um, this, I believe, is his grandson, if I'm not mistaken. So not the same Herod. It talks about James, the brother of John. There are, um, at least from what I saw, there are two different Jameses. I can't say go to James. We got two Jameses in the church, amen? Uh, two different Jameses in the Bible. This is James, the brother of John. Uh, the sons of Zebedee. I'll read a couple scriptures so that way we understand what James this is. In Matthew chapter 4, when Jesus is calling the disciples, they were, they were fishermen. Uh, the Bible says, and going on from thence, he saw other two brethren, James the son of Zebedee, and John his brother. So James was one of the original 12 disciples that Jesus said, come, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. And he followed Jesus Christ. He followed all the way to his death. Uh, that's the same James. James was there with Peter and John on the Mount of Transfiguration when they saw a supernatural event where Jesus was talking and Moses and Elijah uh, came out of nowhere and appeared and were talking with Jesus Christ. And the Bible reports that in Matthew chapter 17. It's that James. In Acts chapter 1, the Bible talks about right after the ascension of Jesus Christ, they went into an upper room where abode both Peter and James and John. And then it lists the other disciples and the followers there. The other John, James, um, a lot of Bible people call him James the Less. Maybe some call him James the Less. I don't know if he, that means he was less of a man, but he's called James the Less, some people. But he was the son of Alphaeus. So when we read about James being killed, this is James, the brother of John. John who penned the Gospel of John. This is his brother James. Uh, he was following Christ. He followed Christ for the three for those three and a half year ministry. He saw Christ crucified. He was he, he was witness of the resurrection. He continued all the work of the Lord, and here now he has been executed, has been killed for preaching the gospel. A couple of details here. The word quaternion, in, and you might have noticed in verse number four that when Peter was taken. He was apprehended, he was put in prison, and delivered to four quaternions of soldiers. A quaternion would be a four, so he was guarded by 16 soldiers. It's also interesting that, uh, that here, Herod, the reason that he killed James, the brother of John, the reason that he took Peter was to gain favor with the Jewish people. And that would be, for a ruler of that time, that would be a quick way to get the people on your side. You get some of the undesirables, the people that they don't like, and you have them executed. And that's exactly the reasoning behind that. The Bible tells us that Peter was taken, he was put in prison, and he was to be brought forth unto the people. At the end of verse 4, it talks about intending after Easter, after this pagan festival, to bring him forth to the people. He would be brought forth most likely to be executed, at least to be publicly beaten and scourged, but probably executed. And in the middle of the night, the angel of the Lord came and performed a jailbreak. Hallelujah. Hey, if, if, uh, if Pastor Medicine or Brother Philip or Brother Pete or Brother, Brother James, no, which one wants to be James the less? Yeah, well, one of the Brother James or Brother Red or Brother Arthur or some of the ladies you are locked up in prison. Boy, y'all have a prayer meeting for us. Y'all ask the Lord to break this out of prison. 
If not, we'll start the, we'll start the jail ministry. Amen. But in the middle of the night, the angel of the Lord came and literally busted Peter out of prison. And in verse number 6, the Bible tells us that the same night, Peter was sleeping between two soldiers, bound with two chains, and the keepers before the door kept the prison. I don't know if you noticed the attention to detail here. They were extremely careful with guarding Peter. Remember, they tried to guard the tomb of Jesus. How'd that work for him? They didn't go so well, did it? They tried to guard the tomb. The angel of the Lord appeared, and they basically, the soldiers went into shock. They rolled the tomb away. That didn't work so well. They tried to guard um, the, other, the other people and guard the other servants of the Lord. And so now they're sleeping. They're not even, they didn't just throw Peter into a common cell. They've got 16 soldiers dedicated to guarding Peter and make sure that he doesn't escape. He's sleeping between two soldiers. Okay, so this is probably the most important prisoner that they have. And God is looking down from heaven and saying, oh, my goodness. If y'all only knew how futile this was. You know, you've got to wonder sometimes, what is God thinking up in heaven? You know, we get down here and we say, Lord, don't you see my problem? How am I going to get myself out of this mess? And Lord is like, God, this, this is so simple. This is so simple. You know, they're trying to guard Peter, making sure Peter can't escape. God's saying, if you only knew what's going to happen tonight. Or we're going to bust Peter out of prison. You have no idea what's about to happen. Um, they met the angel of the Lord came in the middle of the night, brought Peter out of prison. And it's interesting that the wording here in verse number 7, we'll go through the story, then we'll have some application. Verse 7, the angel of the Lord came upon him, and a light shined in the prison, and he smote Peter on the side. He was a sound sleeper. And raised him up, saying, Arise up quickly. And his chains fell off from off his hands. Maybe you missed it. Did you notice that Peter was sleeping? Peter was sleeping. If you were arrested and you knew you were going to be brought out the next morning, probably to be executed, but at least to be beaten after death, that would be a restless night. That would be hard to sleep that night. I think Peter either believed one or two things. He either trusted in the Lord that he would die for the Lord, or he believed that God was going to break him out of prison. What an excellent example. He's probably going to be executed the next morning. And here he's sleeping so soundly that the angel of the Lord comes. The light, the light switch is turned on in the prison. And Peter is sound asleep. He was also sleeping in the garden of Gethsemane. Peter was a sleepy guy. Sleeping in the garden of Gethsemane when he should have been praying. Now he's in prison about to be executed. Ah, no big deal. If I'm going to be executed, I might as well get a good night's sleep. The angel of the Lord comes in. The light shines in the prison. He's still sleeping. And so the angel of the Lord has to pump, punch him in the ribs to wake him up. Out of his slumber. Then the Bible says the chains fell off from his hands. They just fell off. And verse 8, the angel said to him, Gird thyself and bind on thy sandals. Cast thy garment about thee and follow me. And then verse 9, he went out and he wist not it was true what was done by the angel, but thought he saw a vision. So during this time, you know, Peter thinks that he's in a dream. Have you ever been in a dream that seemed very realistic? Amen. I remember as a kid being on the on the uh, the bunk beds on the top bunk and having a dream that I was falling off of a cliff and I really did fall from the top bunk down to the floor. Um, and I've had a dream as an adult and in my dream I did something terrible, something wrong, and I woke up in the morning and thought I had really done it. And I've been thinking, oh my goodness, how I've ruined my life or ruined my marriage forever. And then, wait, 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 it's just a dream. It's just a dream. <laughs> Praise the Lord. And uh, that's what Peter thought. He thought he was in a dream. Um, he thought he saw a vision, but he was physically walking. And the Bible says he walked through the gate, led to the city, and then eventually comes um, to, uh, to the house of Mary where they are having a prayer meeting. It's amazing that God um, uses a supernatural uh, vision. God uses an angel, but Peter physically does walk right out of prison. And I wonder the, the people that saw Peter walking, I wonder if you could see the angel. I wonder if the angel just took on a form of another person. Um, you got to wonder. The Bible doesn't give us a lot of details on there. Three things I'd like to pull from Acts chapter 12. Okay, this has been an exciting story, but three things how what we can learn from this story. Number one is the power of prayer. Can I get a hallelujah? The power of prayer. Boy, let us never forget how powerful our prayers can be. Sometimes we don't think they're powerful because we don't see the powerful <laughs> answers that we want. And because we, we are people, we are, we, we, we are flesh, we are human people, we, we want results, we want things to happen, we want things to change, and if we want, uh, we pray for uh, Jay and Donovan to come to church on Sunday morning and get baptized, we pray, last night I prayed, this morning I prayed, this afternoon I prayed, and if they don't come, you know, it's, boy, it could be a little scourging, Lord, 
We witnessed. We did everything. We prayed. A bunch of us prayed. We're, we're asking you to do a work. And it can be discouraging because we expect God to just supernaturally strong arm him and shove him through the doors and push him in the baptistry and bring him up and then bring him to church every week after that. So if we're not careful, we can get discouraged in our prayer life. But we are to walk by faith and not by sight. Our sight will fool us. Our emotions will fool us. Our feelings will fool us. I stop praying because I just don't see anything happening. Well, you may not see anything happen yet, but we walk by faith and not by sight. Prayer is powerful because the Bible says that it's powerful. Prayer is not powerful because you are powerful. Prayer is not powerful because you read a book on prayer. Prayer is not powerful because you've been saved for a long time. Prayer is powerful because God says that it's powerful. And you can bank on it, brother. And verse number 5, Acts 12, 5, we just looked at it. But Peter was in prison, and prayer was made without ceasing of the church unto God for him. Um, one of the men, obviously, there were you know, 12 disciples, the apostles, most of them. A lot of them were still here at the church in Jerusalem. The church in Jerusalem, remember, we're not talking about a church of 25 people. Remember, remember in Acts chapter 2, there were thousands of people saved, and thousands more continued to get saved. They, did, they could not all meet in one auditorium. They could not, you know, send letters and send curtains out and saying, hey, we've got 4,000 people in our church. We're going to meet at such and such, you know, cathedral amphitheater. We're going to have a massive prayer meeting for Peter. Okay, James just got killed with the sword. Ain't nobody showing up to prayer meeting publicly. Instead, what the Bible seems to point out is that they had prayer meeting at this house. Prayer meeting at that house. Prayer meeting over here. And somebody would be in charge of leading this group. Somebody would be in charge of leading that group. And the Bible tells us that they met at the house of a, of, of a lady named Mary. And this is where the prayer meeting was. And prayer was made without ceasing. Uh, that gives the impression that it was a 24-hour prayer. It was constant. And uh, maybe you've been to an all-night prayer meeting. I've been to an all-night prayer meeting before. And uh, basically, if you don't do it right, <laughs> it could be an all-night falling asleep uh, falling asleep meeting, but you have a time of reading, a time of devotion, and then you have a time of personal prayer. Then you pray with a partner, then you pray in a group, and then you pray for this, and then you pray for that. And then you get some coffee, and as you're drinking coffee, you're praying and asking the Lord to keep your way. And that's what it was. Prayer was made without ceasing. Or maybe possibly they had uh, several people that came, and your job was to pray for two hours. And you just begged God, and you quoted scriptures on prayer, and you begged God to do something for two hours. And when you left, somebody else would come up to the church and pray for the next two hours. Boy, that's the kind of prayer that we need when we need God to do something. Amen? If we're not careful, you know, we get on our knees for a couple minutes, and, um, and we say, Lord, would you please do something? Would you please work a miracle? And then we get up and, and we leave. And maybe we're all guilty of that. I think we're all guilty of that. But here in this time, prayer was made without ceasing. It was a round-the-clock prayer. Uh, look down at verse number 12. And when, this is Peter, and when he had considered the thing, he came to the house of Mary, the mother of John, whose surname was Mark, where many were gathered together praying. Again, paying attention to detail. This is Mary. Now, there are many Marys, many Marys in the Bible. This is Mary, the mother of John. Now, who was it that just got killed with the sword? James. Who was James's brother? John. So this poor lady just had her son, her adult son, but just had her son <coughs> murdered, brutally executed just for preaching the gospel, but she doesn't quit. She doesn't give up. Now she's having a prayer meeting praying for Peter. Boy, what a good testimony. Well, how should we handle a tragedy in our life? Well, we don't need to Go away for weeks and weeks and months at a time and, and hide and then try to try to collect herself. She this is the this took place in the same chapter and they're meeting at her house. Now let me ask you, ladies, if your son, even your adult son, was murdered just a day or just a few days ago, how would you feel about having a big prayer meeting at your house? That's hard. That's hard. Normally, you go through something like that, and, you know, I, I need a few weeks to collect my thoughts and to get back on board. But this dear lady, Mary, just lost her son. He was executed for preaching the gospel, and already she's like, hey, we're having a prayer meeting. The Lord is good. The Lord is good. The Lord can do something. The Lord didn't spare my son, but maybe the Lord can spare Peter. And she's already hosting a prayer meeting at her house. What an amazing, sweet lady Miss Mary was. And, but they were gathered there together praying. You know, this church, this group of believers, there was nothing they could do to get Peter out of prison. Now, maybe if it happened today, 
you know, we got the First Amendment, but we also got the Second Amendment. Maybe we can get one. We can get Brother James out of the prison. But back then, there was absolutely nothing they could do. You say, well, couldn't they get a lawyer? No, no, not not at this time. For one thing, they didn't have the money. They didn't have the influence. And what they were doing was illegal. All right, who's going to go to a lawyer and say, hey, I'm a Christian. We're here praying, and we need you to represent Peter. No lawyer would represent Peter. It would be a suicide as a lawyer. There was physically nothing that they could do. And so they did what they had been commanded to do. They did their only option. They spent time with the Lord in prayer. They gathered together, men and women, by the way. This is a gathering of men and women in this lady's house, and they had a prayer meeting. James chapter 5, the Bible says, the prayer of faith shall save the sick. Boy, think of the power of prayer. The power of prayer here, God used that to bust Peter out of prison. The power of prayer has the ability to save the sick. When we pray, we are tapping into God's power. Well, God, would you do something? God, would you heal this person? That's it. God, would you give this person strength? God, would you work on this person's heart to bring them to a saving knowledge of you? We're tapping into the power of God. Consistent prayer and the combined prayer of the church Work great miracles and acts, and it can do it today. And God's waiting up in heaven, waiting for us. He wants to hear our prayers. He wants to hear our prayers. So number one, the power of prayer. Number two, number two, the Lord can bring you out. The Lord can bring you out. Look at verse 17. Boy, I get excited about the scriptures and the wording here. Sure. Uh, uh, Peter says, but he beckoning unto them with the hand to hold their peace, declared unto them how the Lord had brought him out. Of the prison. And he said, go show these things unto James. Now remember, this is the other James. This is the James, the son of Alphaeus, because the other one just got uh, just got killed. But the Lord had brought him out. You know, uh, the power of prayer, God's power was there. But it was the Lord that brought Peter out of this prison. You know, the Lord had future plans for Peter. Thus we have the books of First and Second Peter. God had a plan for Peter. The Lord brought him out of that prison so that Peter could continue to serve him. And if we're not careful, we'll pray for God to deliver us from a trial in our life. Then when God delivers us, we say, thanks, Lord. Thanks for that. That was great. I'll call you next time I need you. Thank you, Lord, for delivering me. Next time I get between a rock and a hard place, I'll reach out so you can pull me out. No, God called Peter out of that prison because he had a job for Peter to do. If God saved your soul, he's got a job for you. If God brought you through a trial, he's got a job, a plan, and a purpose for your life. Let's take the opportunities, the second chances that the Lord may give us, and use them to serve and honor him. The Lord can bring you out, out of any situation. I love Psalms chapter 40, one of the most beautiful psalms in the whole entire book of Psalms. And the Bible says, he brought me up also out of an horrible pit, out of the miry clay, and set my feet upon a rock. And establish my goals. If you're unsaved, or even if you are saved and you're not living for the Lord, boy, you're in that miry clay. And you ever been in maybe quicksand or miry clay or uh, something nasty? We had a little, uh, basically a glorified ditch behind my, one of the houses as a kid that we had. And I wanted to walk across it. Um, and the water was literally made no more than to 8 to 10 inches deep. And I knew there was mud, but I didn't think it could be that bad. And I started walking out in the mud, and I started sinking. But, of course, as a kid, you don't think, okay, this is not good. I need to go back. And I started walking into that ditch, into this little canal. And I'm sinking into mud almost all the way up here to my ribs. And uh, I started to panic. Started to panic a little bit. Yelled to my brother and sister, and they threw some wood down. And they were able to crawl out there. I was able to get my arms on the wood and pull my body out. But that's what the Lord brings us out of. And when he brings us out... He establishes our goings. He gives us that firm foundation, but he's got a job for us. He's got a plan for us. So let's not just take advantage of the power of prayer. Let's not just take advantage of the Lord bringing us out of a situation. Let's use that to serve and honor the king. The Lord brought us out, and the Lord brought Peter out. Now, number three, I want you to look down at verse 19. Number three. What can we learn from Acts chapter 12? Now, this moves on with the story, but the same Herod is mentioned. Number three, give God the glory. Amen. Give God the glory. Look at verse number 19. The Bible says, and when Herod, this is the same Herod that killed James, the same Herod arrested Peter. When Herod had sought for him, that was Peter, and found him not, he examined the keepers, look out, and commanded that they should be put to death. All 16 of those men were executed. 
And that may seem harsh, but that was very common for the, for the Roman soldiers at the time. Then the Bible says he went down from Judea to Caesarea and their abode. And Herod was highly displeased with them of Tyre and Sidon. But they came with one accord to him, and having made Blastus, the king's chamberlain, their friend, desired peace, because their country was nourished by the king's country. And upon a set day, Herod, arrayed in royal apparel, sat upon his throne and made an oration unto them. Look at this, verse 22. And the people gave a shout, saying, It is the voice of a God and not of a man. And immediately the angel of the Lord smote him, because he gave not God the glory, and he was eaten of worms and gave up the ghost. Wow. So maybe just think when Herod the king had to, gave the order for uh, James to be executed, he never thought he would be dead not long afterward. When King Herod gave the order to have Peter thrown in prison, I'm sure the church was like, God, do you not see what's going on? God, this wicked, awful King Herod, do you not see the, uh, the wickedness and the cruelty that he's inflicting upon your people? Hey, God knew exactly what was going on. It's interesting also that the Lord punished King Herod. And King Herod was not a believer, okay? I'm sure you knew that. But if you didn't, he wasn't a believer. He was not a saved man. Yet he, yet he punished, supernaturally punished King Herod. Giving this speech, he's in royal apparel, he sat upon his throne, and the speech was so well, he must have been such a great public speaker that the people attributed the title of God to him. There's only one person that holds that title. That's right. God the Father. Amen. That's the King of Kings. That's the God of Genesis and the God of Revelation. That's the God that has no beginning. That's the God that has no ending. The God that is right. from everlasting to everlasting. The Alpha and Omega, beginning and the end. We got to be careful because God is not playing around. We should never take the glory away from the Lord. Do you remember when Jesus Christ <clears throat> made his entry into Jerusalem and they threw the uh, the palm leaves down and the Pharisees and Sadducees were trying to were telling Jesus that he needed to correct his disciples because they were praising him. They were saying Hosanna, Hosanna, and Jesus Christ said, "Well, if they would not praise me, even the rocks would cry out." <clears throat> and if you do your Bible study, you read later on in Revelation. The creation of God will once again praise the Lord, okay? God is not done. God has a plan for his creation. If he cannot get the praise and the honor and the glory from people, he'll get it from the rocks. He'll snap his fingers and the rocks will cry out and praise and praise the Lord. The heavens declare, the Bible tells us in Psalms 19, the glory of God. We should never take glory away from the Lord. We've got to be careful. Um... It's not to say in the right context that you can never compliment somebody. You know, Brother Phillips doing a great job leading the singing. Miss Amber doing a great job playing the piano. Brother James doing a great job on the sound. Somebody said I sounded good this morning. I said that was Brother James in the sound. So we might come up to one of these men or ladies and say, hey, I just want to let you know you're doing a great job. God bless you. I appreciate all the effort you put in there. That's not taking the glory away from God. But we need to be careful about how we receive the praise and the glory from men. It's not as much sinful as the giving as it is the receiving. For example, Proverbs, the Bible tells us, Let another man praise thee, and not thine own mouth, a stranger, and not thine own lips. I should not be singing my praises, and I should not think of myself more highly than I ought to think. Get in the habit of saying, when somebody uh, compliments you on anything, church-related or work-related, just say, I would say, thank you so much, praise the Lord. Boy, God's been so good to me. You need to thank them for that. I told uh, one time a brother, and he was an interesting brother, and uh, I said, brother, you just did a great job. Thank you so much for that. He said, oh, don't tell that to me. I didn't do anything. God gave the glory. And now he's mad at me because I told him he did a good job, okay? And that, that's not the kind of attitude to have. Just say thank you for that. That's encouraging, but praise the Lord. God is good. Get that phrase. Praise the Lord. Give the glory to God because if we're not careful, we'll accept the praise of men, and then we think, man, that was a good sermon. Yeah, that was. But you didn't remember what the title was, but that was a good sermon. Brother Philip, boy, and you know what? I am a good song man. Boy, I'm playing on I am a pretty good piano player. Woo, I'm pretty good. And then we think of ourselves more highly than we ought to think. Right. Herod did that, and he was eaten of worms and gave up the ghost. So reading the context of Scripture, it's not that he got worms and he died six months later. It seems that it happened there. He was eaten of worms and he gave up the ghost. What would it look like to watch someone get eaten by worms? Maybe let's not imagine that. But it must have been something terrible. I wanted to mention this. 
And this is a text that I got from somebody um, a while back. Uh, let me see. And it breaks my heart. And you'll see why here in a minute. You know, talking about giving, uh, giving praise to the Lord and not taking the glory for ourselves. Can I see that? Okay. Let's see here. Bear with me just for a second. Just for a second. <clears throat> it gets really quiet when Pastor stops. When Pastor stops talking. Amen. Okay. I got a text from someone and I texted him, reached out to him. He said, thank you so much. I'm really happy with how I've changed my life around. And he goes on to mention these, mention these um, improvements. He's, he's got his GED, got his license, lost 150 pounds, reunited with friends, having college, this and that. I struggle with this. I have been, he says again, I have been able to change my life. Really makes me proud of myself for all I've done. And it's, it's so sad. It's so sad because if anything good happens in our life, it's because of the Lord. That's right. And, and I told this guy, I told this gentleman, I, I didn't even respond to that text. It broke my heart. And, you know, I, I hope the Lord will have mercy upon him and won't take all those blessings away from him. Boy, if, if this church grows, it, it, it has grown. This church growing, um, it's, it's not because Pastor John then signed. It's not, it's not necessarily just because we go so many. It's because God was merciful and gracious and kind enough to send his blessed Holy Spirit to Elizabeth City Baptist Church. Right. Um, boy, if somebody gets saved, somebody gets baptized, it's not because we got top-notch people here at Elizabeth City Baptist Church. It's because God's Holy Spirit worked on that person's heart and brought them to salvation. We've got to make sure we give God the glory. We don't want to take that because if we start taking the glory away from God, God's going to say, Okay, you think you're you think you're pretty good. Okay, let me take my candlestick out. See how you do now. Yeah, that's what I thought. And then it goes so well. We don't want God to look at us and be jealous because God is a jealous God. He wants the praise and the honor and the glory.